This is Dr. Kurt Waller for the Mitochondria Mastery Course. This is a course content sample video. And the title here is Mitochondria and Krebs Cycle Points of Entry and Clinical Considerations. So when we look at mitochondria fundamentally with regards to metabolism, fats, carbohydrates, and proteins all can funnel down either to acetyl coenzyme A or from a amino acid standpoint, actually enter the citric acid cycle, what's also called the Krebs cycle, for eventual transfer, uh, transfer over into the electron transport chain for the production of ATP. And so that fundamentally is very important because ATP is that cellular energy currency that's needed to be produced by the mitochondria for uh, energy uh, utilization throughout the body. Now it's very interesting when we go inside the mitochondria, which is where the citric acid cycle, also called the Krebs cycle, exists. There's a number of entry points into the Krebs cycle. The first actually exists with acetyl coenzyme A, which comes off of pyruvic acid through glycolysis. So Glycolysis converts glucose into pyruvic acid, and then a very important enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase, which needs a number of nutrients, um, B vitamins, magnesium, for example, lipoic acid. So it converts, pyruvate dehydrogenase converts pyruvic acid into acetyl coenzyme A. And actually, this is a highly regulated enzyme and there are genetic disorders actually linked to uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency, which can lead to lactic acid acidosis. But if we successfully convert into acetyl coenzyme A, it becomes the substrate or coactivator of citrate synthase to help convert oxaloacetate, the last step of the Krebs cycle, into citric acid. Another entry point is at alpha ketoglutaric acid. Again, it is a dehydrogenase enzyme that requires the same nutrients that pyruvate dehydrogenase does. Another entry point is succinyl coenzyme A, as well as fumarate, or what's called fumaric acid. So when we think of amino acids and their ability to get into the mitochondria for ATP production, there are many paths to take. Certain amino acids like alanine, glycine, cysteine, and serine can be converted to pyruvic acid, which then get converted to acetyl coenzyme A. Others can enter directly at acetyl coenzyme A, or still others can get in. Uh, one of them, by the way, is oxaloacetate, which can get there either through aspartic acid or asparginine. But I'm going to focus right here in this short video on a few other entry points which I had mentioned previously. One, succinyl coenzyme A and fumaric acid. So if we pull the lens back on the biochemistry and understand that this is B12, so cobalamin, this is what this represents, is vitamin B12. Now we know that vitamin B12 is very important for energy metabolism in our body. In fact, people who are B12 deficient often have poor cognitive abilities, are at risk for dementia, uh, as well as being fatigued. Now, B12 that gets methylated by methylfolate is important for the conversion of homocysteine to methionine in the methylation cycle. So methionine synthase is the enzyme that is involved in converting homocysteine to methionine a very critical step in the methylation cycle, which requires B12 as methyl B12 or methylcobalamin. But when we talk about mitochondrial activity, it all has to do with adenosylcobalamin. Adenosylcobalamin converts what's called L-methylmalonyl coenzyme A through the actions of an enzyme called a mutase enzyme that converts this chemical into succinyl coenzyme A. And that is critical with regards to Krebs cycle activity. Whenever we think of Krebs cycle activity, that also is critical with regards to mitochondrial activity. If we pull back and look at the biochemistry from a much broader standpoint, 
we have a number of entry points into a chemical called propionyl coenzyme A. Odd chain fatty acids, certain amino acids like valine, isoleucine, threonine, and methionine. Methionine, by the way, coming off the methylation cycle. And even propionic acid from gut bacteria get converted into propionyl coenzyme A. Well, propionyl coenzyme A becomes what's called D-methylmalonyl coenzyme A that gets converted to the L form when we have a B12 deficiency. So just consider this to be B12. If we have a B12 deficiency, you will see an increase of methylmalonic acid. Now that is an organic acid measured on organic acid testing. And methylmalonic is an indirect marker of B12 status. Many people who have ele elevated methylmalonic acid have chronic fatigue or can develop dementia or other B12 deficiency related disorders. So basically they're B12 anemic. If you were to look at a blood test, that would be megaloblastic anemia, for example. So the mean corpuscular volume or the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is actually elevated. Methylmalonic acid, often organic acid test, is a representative marker of a B12 deficiency. But it actually is really fairly specific for adenosylcobalamin. So adenosylcobalamin is critically important for the activation of methylmalonyl coenzyme A to make succinyl coenzyme A another important entry point into the citric acid cycle. So a deficiency of B12 can lead to a decrease of succinyl coenzyme A, which can lead to a decrease of Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle activity, which leads to a decrease of ATP production. The main thing that feeds into this pathway are these specific amino acids. So even though the, the preferential use of amino acids isn't necessarily for mitochondrial activity, um, it does play an important role in cellular metabolism. There's another actually interesting important entry point into the Krebs cycle with regards to mitochondrial activity, and that is at the level of fumarate, also called fumaric acid. If you've ever done organic acid testing, specifically if you've done organic acid testing from Great Plains Lab, on page two of that test is this catecholamine neurotransmitter chart. Now this is mostly used to try to determine the functional status for the production of dopamine as well as norepinephrine, primarily through the evaluation or the viewpoint of what's called dopamine beta hydroxylase, which converts dopamine to norepinephrine. Well, it turns out there are amino acids that are important as a precursor to dopamine, namely phenylalanine and tyrosine. And each one of these steps requires a specific enzyme. Phenylalanine hydroxylase converts phenylalanine to tyrosine, and tyrosine hydroxylase converts tyrosine to dopa. So let's focus right here on the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine. A genetic disorder called phenylcutinuria, which occurs in children and which can be very dangerous, can cause problems in the brain or nervous system. So it can lead to seizures, tremors, microcephaly. Many of these kids have hypopigmentation and they have elevated levels of phenylalanine, phenylpyruvic, phenylactic, or phenylacetic acids that are found in the blood and or urine. A lot of these kids actually have a musty odor to their urine. So a block of phenylalanine hydroxylase leads to phenylcutinuria. In fact, this is one of the more common newborn screening assessments that's done for all kids uh, uh, to evaluate for the existence of PKU. But where I want to focus on here is just understanding that certain uh, neurochemicals or, or amino acids, for uh, I should be saying, are very important for other means. So we know that phenylalanine getting converted to tyrosine is important for other tissue proteins. In fact, tyrosine is an important amino acid for thyroid production. It helps form melanin or the pigment in our skin. 
it helps form catecholamines like dopamine. But with regards to the mitochondria, it forms a chemical called fumarate acetoacetate. Let's look. Fumarate acetoacetate is a chemical coming off of tyrosine metabolism. It turns out that fumarate enters the Krebs cycle at the level of fumaric acid. So it's another entry point. Acetoacetate is a ketone that can also be used as an energy source. So when we think of the multiple entry points into the Krebs cycle, it's not just acetyl coenzyme A, although that is critically important. And so the inability to form acetyl coenzyme A is a big deal from a clinical health standpoint because it can lead to fatigue as well as in severe conditions, it can lead to mitochondrial shutdown that can manifest as neurological disorders. It can lead to cardiovascular problems, immune system disorders. In children, it may lead to seizures uh, and lack of development. So pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme is dependent on a wide variety of different nutrients. The glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate, which I had mentioned, also requires those same nutrients that the pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A conversion requires. This is one way that we regulate glutamate levels. If we have faulty function in the ability to convert glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate, that can lead to excess glutamate in the brain and nervous system, which can be a trigger for neurodegenerative diseases. Pyruvate to oxaloacetate is an interesting chemical reaction in that this is one way to maintain Krebs cycle activity, even though we may have high amounts of acetyl coenzyme A that have been produced. So it's sort of a, a pressure valve, if you will, uh, metabolically. I just mentioned that propionyl coenzyme A gets converted to succinyl coenzyme A through the actions of B12 as well as biotin. Hugely important in activating succinyl coenzyme A as an entry point and stimulator of Krebs cycle activity. Clearly, if we have a B12 deficiency, that can lead to mitochondrial problems, cognitive issues, fatigue issues, etc. And then the last would be tyrosine to fumaric acid. So another way that amino acids like tyrosine help to stimulate mitochondrial activity. Now, as part of the Mitochondria Mastery course, we not only talk in depth about what we just discussed, but one of the ways that we evaluate this is learning how to use certain functional and integrative medicine testing to look at mitochondrial activity more in depth and then look at the clinical correlations. So for example, this is just a screenshot of a Krebs cycle and amino acid metabolite section of an organic acid test. And we'll notice that we've got a number of markers high like succinic, malic, akinetic and citric. All of these are actually part of the Krebs cycle and elevations of these indicate things biochemically. So for example, citric is often elevated when you have a glutathione deficiency. Succinic is often elevated in the presence of chemical and heavy metal exposure. Methylglutaric and hydroxyglutaric or 3-methylglutaric, 3-hydroxyglutaric, for example, are linked to leucine and lysine metabolism. And this has implications for people as well because these things can indicate either genetic shutdown or nutritional um, deficiencies that are compromising the ability to actually convert amino acids into mitochondrial uh, substrate for ATP production. And there can be different cognitive issues that are involved or fatigue issues that can be involved with those uh, reactions as well. And so that becomes a critical component of our ability to analyze things biochemically in the clinical context of a particular patient. Now I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler, the clinical uh, educator for the Mitochondria Mastery course. Now I've been an integrative and functional medicine physician since the late 90s. Uh, I'm a speaker, I speak throughout the United States as well as internationally on different concepts related to integrative and functional medicine. I'm an author, educator, and practicing clinician. I've been a clinical educator for 
Great Plains Laboratory for many years, as well as Integrative Medicine Academy, which hosts the many mastery courses, including the Mitochondria Mastery Course, which this content is taken from. I'm co-founder and education director of Integrative Medicine Academy and Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, which is a membership site for healthcare practitioners. In my private practice, I specialize in working with individuals on the autism spectrum, chronic, as well as uh, patients or people dealing with environmental induced health conditions. I would encourage you to look at the information on the Mitochondria Mastery Course website. One of the key components of all of our mastery courses, including the Mitochondria Mastery Course, is think critically and always think clinically. When evaluating this information, looking whether you're studying the biochemistry, whether you're looking at supplements, whether you're looking at lab tests, is applying that information in a really critical clinical standpoint for the best outcome for your patients and clients. You can go to mitochondriamasterycourse.com for more information uh, to uh, see if this material is of interest to you. Again, I am Dr. Kurt Wohler for the Mitochondria Mastery Course. Thank you.